But on the Isle of Sheppey, there's a man who can live in his railway fantasy every hour of every day. Vic Martin's retirement bungalow is called Warden Central. The station is on no railway map, appears on no timetable. But in Victor Martin's mind, it is a station. Not on the Isle of Sheppey, but on the pre-war Midland Main Line between St Pancras and St Albans. Every day, Vic and his wife Lou put on their uniforms and go on duty. The platform, the crossing gate and the signals are full size. But these are only the trappings of the dream, the frontiers to keep reality at bay. There are no trains for riding on. You can't go anywhere from this station, except in the mind. All the visible moving parts of Victor's dream world are built in a 60-foot hut with a signal box at each end. To enter her husband's world, Lou becomes the signalman at Swale Tunnel Junction, working her trains every day to the old Midland rules, on the upline to St Pancras. There's a freight coming down on the... Um... And relief line. Then I have to look and see if there's um, space for it to go through and it can go right through so I can put the distance off. That's because your line is quite clear, isn't yes, it? Yes, you see, if there's no lights there, I know that it's a straight through run. That's to say the train is entering my section. And when you married Mr. Martin, did you have any idea that you'd have to let yourself in for this sort of stuff? Well, no, not really, because we hadn't got this box then. I used to do a little of it in the other, when we had the little box. But... Because my father's on the line all his life, so the jargon's so familiar that it comes back to you, you know. My father always talked a lot about it, so it takes me back to my childhood, really. It's rather fun. <laughs> the trains can only be seen over the 20 yards of track between Lou's signal box and Vic's. Then they disappear into a loop of tunnels around half an acre of garden. But in Victor's eye, they're heading for Glasgow, Nottingham, Manchester and Leicester, and it may be weeks before they're due to come back. Hasn't cleared the line yet. They won't be long now. There goes, there's the first one, there's their starter, we're away. There's a train being offered on the up road. That's the fast. I'm just watching the freight away to see her distance off, and it is, we're away. 6.35 to Nottingham. I'm just pulling off the signals now on the up road for the fast. Now putting down the block sections for it and having a look on the track circuit to make sure they're clear. I'm looking out for the freight, see that she's coming up all right on her seat, on her track circuit over there. Here comes the up now, just coming. There she is, she's passing through that signal box. We're now putting the block over and here she comes. Always a good train, this all the way from Glasgow. Now going up through Clarence Tunnel to St Pancras. How much difference do the uniforms make? Have you always used uniforms? Yes, we've the always started? used them. We've been very fortunate in having uniforms, you see. And so, of course, we've always used them. Does it make very much difference to the way you feel about it? How well, important? I think it does, really, you know. We, we always have used them, you know. It sort of gives the effect, I suppose, and that kind of thing, you know. Would you have liked to have been in a railway? Oh, yes, I would. I, in 1914, I was very, very keen to go on the line, and I was a young lad then, you see. I was at school, my father was at a very poor view of the railway altogether, really. And he, you know, had different ideas that I ought to go through the vast. We lived in Oxford, you see, and that was a good opportunity, but I wanted to get on the footplate. I did get on for about two days on the Great Western, but he soon got me off. So how long ago did you start planning to have your own railway? Well, I started planning to have my own railway, um, Oh, 19, well I've known all my life I'd really do it, you know, and I started getting ready in 1937, started buying equipment, and so a good job I did because it'd be a terrible price today, 
And uh, I'd saved up about, uh, well, just over 300 pounds, I suppose, for, um, you know, for this railway job. And I spent a lot. And then, of course, the war broke out. Excuse me a minute. What's happening now? Got a train stuck at St Pancras. Uh, I have to go up there and see what's wrong. Because you do get these things go wrong sometimes. And here's one going wrong now. So I think we'd better go and have yeah. a look at it. Think it might be a crash or something? No, a derailment? no, it wouldn't be a derailment. It'd be, might be mice, you know, got dirt on the rail because that's the sort of thing it looks like, you see. Anyway, we'll deal with this up train first, and then we'll go in and see what's wrong with that after. Now, just how responsible do you feel? I mean, have you had an accident in which you've had casualties? Yes. Well, there's a coach over there. I, I think I showed you earlier. Got the end smashed in. Can you see? We use it now at the side of the line to. Um, uh, make their tea and all that kind of thing, you see, that old coach over there. Well, that's made of Bakelite. The firm, unfortunately, doesn't exist today, but used to make some quite good rolling stock, although I haven't got a lot of it. And an engine, a train ran into the back of that through an error of the, of the driver, which was me, you see, because I, my wife doesn't drive the train, she works the signals, but I'm, I'm not only working the signals, but driving them. And I ran into the back of that train, and the train that ran into the back of it, the back of it had two engines on it. And so it's what it smashed the end. That was the last coach. Smashed the ending, and we reckon that about eight or nine people would have been either killed or pretty seriously hurt. But of course, it smashed all the end of it and derailed the coach as well. So I think that's the worst accident we've ever had. What other special trains do you have to run then? Well, you run Easter, you see, about a week before. Or Whitson was the last holiday. We got together, the wife and I, you see, and we said, well, now. We ought to run 10, 15 specials, you see, say five on the down road and uh, say six on the up. Well, then you look at the timetables, and of course you've got to think that usually over holiday time the workman's trains are not running, so you've got little spaces there where you can fit one in, or you can run it where freight normally run, you see, a freight uh, working maybe off, and you can put one in there, you see. You work that all out beforehand, like the railways do. And, of course, you know they print these special instructions which are issued to all signalmen. Well, then we write two of these out, and Lou has one, and I have one in this box, and we put them here, and there they are, you see. And you keep a count of the special train on a special sheet. You write down the, uh, the time the train left and where it's going and so forth, and we can look back on these sheets right back to 1948. What would you say was the biggest crisis you've ever had on the road? Uh, well, I think Suez probably. You know there was a crisis some years ago, and of course we didn't know that they were how many troop trains they ran, but we imagined they did, you see, and so of course we had a terrific number of trains down to Southampton and the other ports for the, uh, we imagined of course, for the war office and the government. 